Chapter Twenty One of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume Four by Eliza Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One Affords Variety of Amusements. Mrs. Munden was so ignorant of her own heart in relation to what is felt on Mr. Trueworth's account that she imagined she had only fled his presence because she could not bear a man who had courted her so long should see her thus unhappy by the choice she had made of another i am well assured cried she that he has too much generosity to triumph in my misfortune and too much complaisance to remind me of the cause yet would his eyes tacitly reproach my want of judgment and mine too might perhaps in spite of me confess as the poet says that i like the child whose folly proved its loss refused the gold and did accept the dross this naturally leading her into some reflections on the merit of mr trueworth she could not help wondering by what infatuation she had been governed when rejecting him or what was tantamount to rejecting him treating him in such a manner as might make him despair of being accepted what though my heart was insensible of love said she my reason nay my very pride might have influenced me to embrace a proposal which would have rendered me the envy of my own sex and excited the esteem and veneration of the other thinking still more deeply oh god cried she with vehemence to what a height of happiness might i have been raised and into what an abyss of wretchedness am i now plunged irretrievably undone married without loving or being beloved lost in my bloom of years to every joy that can make life a blessing nothing so much sharpens the edge of affliction as a consciousness of having brought it upon ourselves to remember that all we could wish for all that could make us truly happy was once in our power to be possessed of and wantonly shunning the good that heaven and fortune offered we headlong run into the ills we mourn renders them doubly grievous this being the case with our heroine how ought all the fair and young to guard against a vanity so fatal to a lady who but for this one foible had been the happiest as she was in all other respects the most deserving of her sex but to return a just sensibility of the errors of her past conduct joined with some other emotions which the reader may easily guess at though she as yet knew not the meaning of herself gave her but little repose that night and pretty early the next morning she received no inconsiderable addition to her perplexities the time in which mr munden had promised to give his answer to the lawyer was now near expired yet he was as irresolute as ever loath he was to have the affair between him and his wife made public and equally loath to comply with her demands before he did either it therefore came into his head to try what effect menaces would produce and accordingly wrote to her in these terms to mrs munden madam though your late behaviour has proved the little affection you have for me i still retain too much for you to be able to part with you no be assured i never will forego the right that marriage give me over you will never yield to live a widower while i am a husband and if you return not within four-and-twenty hours shall take such measures as the law directs to force you back to my embraces by this time to-morrow you may expect to have such company at your levy as you will not be well pleased with and from whose authority not all your friends can screen you but as i am unwilling to expose you i once more court you to spare yourself this disgrace and me the pain of inflicting it i give you this day to consider on what you have to do the future peace of us both depends on your result for your own reason ought to inform you that being brought to me by compulsion will deserve other sort of treatment than such as you might hope to find on returning of your own accord to your much affronted husband g munden this letter very much alarmed both the sister and the brother 
the former trembled at the thoughts of seeing herself in the hands of the officers of justice and the latter could not but be uneasy that a disturbance of this kind should happen in his house they were just going to send for mr markland to consult him on what was to be done when that gentleman whom chance had brought that way luckily came in he found mr thoughtless in great discomposure and mrs munden almost drowned in tears on being informed of the occasion i see no reason said he gravely for all this i cannot think that mr munden will put in execution what he threatens at least not till after i have spoke to him again i rather think he writes in this manner only to terrify you madam into a submission to his will however continued he after a pretty long pause to be secure from all danger of an affront this way i think it would be highly proper you should retire to some place where he may not know to find you till i have once more tried how far he may be prevailed upon to do you justice this advice being highly approved of my wife's sister resumed he has a very pleasant and commodious house on the bank of the river on the surrey side she takes lodges sometimes but at present is without so that if you resolve to be concealed you cannot find a more convenient retreat especially as it's being so near london nothing of moment can happen here but what you may be apprised of in little more than an hour mrs munden testifying as much satisfaction at this proposal as a person in her circumstances could be capable of feeling mr markham told her that he was ready to conduct her immediately to the place he mentioned and her brother adding that he would accompany them and see his sister safe to her new abode they all set out together on their little voyage mrs munden having first given directions to her servants where they should follow her with such things as she thought would be wanted during her stay there on their arrival they found mr markland had spoken very modestly of the place he recommended the house was pleasant almost beyond description and rendered much more so by the obliging behaviour of its owner they all dined together that day and on parting it was agreed that mrs munden should send her man every morning to town in order to bring her intelligence of whatever accidents had happened in relation to her affairs on the preceding day as much as this lady had rejoiced at the kind reception she had met with from her brother under her misfortunes she was now equally pleased at being removed from a time from him not only because she thought herself secure from any insults that might be offered by her husband but also because this private recess seemed a certain defence against the sight of mr trueworth a thing she knew not well how to have avoided in town without breaking off her acquaintance with lady lovett after the gentlemen were gone the sister-in-law of mr markland led her fair guest into the garden which before she had only a cursory view of she showed her among many other things the several curious exotic plants which she told her she had procured from the nurseries of some persons of condition to whom she had the honour to be known but mrs munden being no great connoisseur that way did not take much notice of what she said concerning them till coming to the lower end she perceived a little wicket gate to where does this lead cried she i will show you presently madam replied the other and pulling it open they both entered into a grass walk hemmed in on each side with trees which seemed as old as the creation they had not gone many paces before an arbour erected between two of these venerable monuments of antiquity and overspread with jessamines and honeysuckles attracted mrs munden's eyes oh how delightful is this said she it would have been much more so madam if it had been placed on the other side of the walk said the gentlewoman and if i live till next spring we'll have the position of it altered you will presently see my reasons for it continued she if you please to turn your eyes a little to the right mrs munden doing as she was desired had the prospect of a very beautiful garden decorated with plots of flowers statues and trees cut in a most elegant manner does all this belong to you demanded she somewhat surprised no madam 
answered the other but they are part of the same estate and at present rented by a gentleman of condition who lives at the next door the walk we are in is also common to us both each having a gate to enter it at pleasure though indeed they little frequent it having much finer of their own with such little chat they beguiled the time till the evening dew reminded them it was best to quit the open air mrs munden passed this night in more tranquillity than she had done many preceding ones she awoke however much sooner than was her custom and finding herself less disposed to return to the embraces of sleep than to partake that felicity she heard a thousand cheerful birds turning their little throats in praise she heard a thousand cheerful birds turning their little throats in praise of she rose and went down into the garden the contemplative humour she was in led her to the arbour she had been so much charmed with the night before she threw herself upon the mossy seat where scenting the fragrancy of the sweets around her made more delicious by the freshness of the morning's gale how delightful said she to herself is this solitude how truly preferable to all the noisy giddy pleasures of the tumultuous town yet how i have despised and ridiculed the soft sincerity of a country life then recollecting some discourse she formerly had with mr trueworth on that subject i wonder cried she what mr trueworth would say if he knew the change that a little time has wrought in me he would certainly find me now more deserving of his friendship than ever he could think me of his love but he is ignorant insensible of my real sentiments and if sir basil and lady lovett should tell him with what abruptness i fled their house at the news of his approach i must appear in his eyes the most vain stupid thankless creature i once was but such is my unhappy situation that i dare not even wish he should discover what passes in my heart the just sensibility of his amiable qualities and of the services he has done me which would once have been meritorious in me to have avowed would now be highly criminal with these reflections she took mr trueworth's picture which she always carried about her and looking on it with the greatest tenderness though i no more must see himself said she i may at least be allowed to pay the tribute of my gratitude to this dumb representative of the man to whom i have been so much obliged at this instant a thousand proofs of love given her by the original of the copy in her hand occurring all at once to her remembrance tears filled her eyes and her breast swelled with involuntary sighs in this painfully pleasing amusement did she continue for some time and had doubtless done so much longer if a sudden rustling among the leaves behind her had not made her turn her head to see what had occasioned it but where are the words that can express the surprise the wild confusion she was in when the first glance of her eyes presented her with the sight of the real object whose image she had been thus tenderly contemplating she shrieked the picture dropped from her hand the use of her faculties forsook her she sunk from the seat where she was sitting and had certainly fainted quite away but for the immediate assistance of the person who had caused the extraordinary emotions her fancy indeed strong as it was had formed no visionary appearance it was the very identical mr trueworth who chance had brought to make the discovery of a secret which of all things in the world he had the least suspicion of he was intimately acquainted with the person to whom the house adjoining to that where mrs munden lodged belonged and hearing where he was on his return from oxfordshire had come the evening before intending to pass a day or two with him in this agreeable recess as he was never a friend too much sleeping he rose that morning and went down into the garden before the greatest part of the family had quitted their beds he saw mrs munden while at too great a distance to know who she was yet did her air and motion as she walked strike him with something which made him willing to see what sort of face belonged to so genteel a form drawing more near his curiosity was gratified with a sight he little expected 
he was just about to accost her with the salutation of the morning when she went into the arbour and seated herself in the manner already described the extreme pensiveness of her mind had hindered her from perceiving that any one was near but the little covert under which she was placed being open on both sides he had a full view of everything she did though she was in the most negligent night-dress that could be she seemed as lovely to him as ever all his first flames rekindled in his heart while gazing on her with his uninterrupted freedom he longed to speak to her but durst not lest by doing so he should be deprived of the pleasure he now enjoyed till observing she had something in her hand which she seemed to look upon with great attention and sometimes betrayed agitations he had never seen in her before he was impatient to discover if possible the motive he therefore advanced as gently as he could towards the back of the arbour which having no woodwork and the leafy canopy only supported by osier boughs placed at a good distance from each other he had a full opportunity of beholding all that the reader has been told but what was his amazement to find it was his own picture that very picture which had been taken from the painters was the object of her meditations he heard her sighs he saw her lovely hand frequently put up to wipe away the tears that fell from her eyes while looking on it he also saw her more than once though doubtless in those moments not knowing what she did press the lifeless image to her bosom with the utmost tenderness scarce could he give credit to the testimony of his senses near as he was to her he even strained to fight to be more sure and forgetting all the precautions he had taken thrust himself as far as he was able between the branches of which the arbour was composed on perceiving the effect this last action had produced the gate though not above twenty paces off seemed too slow a passage to fly to her relief and setting his foot upon a pedestal of a statue quick as thought or the flash of elemental fire sprang over the myrtle hedge that parted the garden from the walk ah madam cried he catching her in his arms to hinder her from falling what has the unhappy trueworth done to render his presence so alarming how have i deserved to appear thus dreadful in your eyes that admirable presence of mind which mrs munden had shown on many occasions did not in this entirely leave her the time he was speaking those few words sufficed to enable her to recollect her scattered spirits and withdrawing herself from the hold he had taken of her and removing a little farther on the bench as if to give him room to sit sir said she with a voice pretty well composed the obligations i have to you demand other sort of sentiments than those you seem to accuse me of but i thought myself alone and was not guarded against the surprise of meeting you in this place i ought indeed replied he to have been more cautious in my approach especially as i found you in deep contemplation which perhaps i have been my own enemy by interrupting till he spoke in this manner she was not quite assured how far he had been witness of her behaviour but what he now said confirming her of what she had but feared before threw her into a second confusion little inferior to the former he saw it but saw it without that pity he would have felt had it proceeded from any other motive and eager to bring to a more full eclaircissement if you really think madam said he that you have any obligations to me you may requite them all by answering sincerely to one question tell me i beseech you continued he taking up the picture which she had neither thought nor opportunity to remove from the place where it had fallen resolve me how this little picture came into your possession what was now the condition of mrs munden she could neither find any pretence to evade the truth nor fit words to confess it till mr trueworth repeating his request and vowing he would never leave her till she granted it but what need have i to answer said she blushing you know in what manner it was taken from the painters and the sight of it in my hand is sufficient to inform you of the whole charming declaration transporting ravishing to thought cried he kissing her hand 
oh had i known it sooner engaged as i then was to one who well deserved my love could i have guessed miss betsy thoughtless was the contriver of that tender fraud i know not what revolution might have happened in my heart the empire you had there was never totally extirpated and kindness might have regained what cruelty had lost do not deceive yourself sir said she interrupting him with all the courage she could assume nor mistake that for love which was only the effects of mere gratitude these words were accompanied with a look which once would have struck him with the most submissive awe but he was now too well acquainted with the sentiments she had for him to be deterred by any other outward show of coldness call it by what name you please cried he so you permit me the continuance of it and vouchsafe me the same favours you bestow on my insensible resemblance in speaking this he threw his arms about her waist not regarding the effort she made to hinder him and clasped her to his breast with a vehemence which in all his days of courtship to her he never durst attempt forbear sir said she you know i am not at liberty to be entertained with discourses nor with actions of this nature loose me this moment or be assured all the kind thoughts i had of you and on which you have too much presumed will be converted into the extremest hate and detestation the voice in which she uttered this menace convincing him how much she was in earnest he let go his hold removed some paces from her and beheld her for some moments with a silent admiration i have obeyed you madam cried he with a deep sigh you are all angel be all angels still far be it from me to tempt you from the glorious height you stand in yet how unhappy has this interview made me i love you without daring even to wish for a return nay so fully has your virtue conquered that i must love you more for the repulse you have given my two audacious hopes you may at least pity the fate to which i am condemned it would be in vain for me replied she in a voice somewhat broken by the inward conflict she sustained to endeavour to conceal what my inadvertences have so fully betrayed to you and you must assure yourself that i shall think on you with all the tenderness that honour and the duties of my station will admit but remember sir i am a wife and being such ought never to see you more in regard therefore to my reputation and peace of mind i must entreat you will henceforth avoid my presence with the same care i will do yours severe as this injunction is replied he my soul avows the justice of it and i submit farewell then said she rising from her seat oh farewell cried he and kissed her hand with emotions not to be expressed farewell for ever rejoined she turned hastily away to prevent his seeing the tears with which her eyes were overcharged and in that cruel instant overflowed her cheeks she advanced with all the speed she could towards the wicket gate but when there could not forbear giving one look behind and perceiving he had left the walk and was proceeding through the garden with folded arms and a dejected pace poor true worth cried she and pursued him with her eyes till he was quite out of sight some readers may perhaps blame mr trueworth as having presumed too far on the discovery of the lady's passion and others of a contrary way of thinking laugh at him for being so easily repulsed but all in general must applaud the conduct of mrs munden till this dangerous instance she had never had an opportunity of showing the command she had over herself and as mr eastcourt justly says ne'er let the fair one boast of virtue proved till she has well refused the man she truly loved end of chapter twenty one